Okay, welcome everybody. I appreciate you all being here for our 72nd webinar of our series. We just got a couple left in 2020. Uh, we've done a bunch of them, had a great time, learned all sorts of cool stuff. This is going to be the first one on this topic. It's going to be the first one on this topic that uh, is going to be of a series of, of, of this. This is almost 101 of, of uh, virtual data coaching. And we're going to kind of talk about the overview, you know, maybe a little bit about how we do it, but it'll uh, uh, we'll have more coming with more details in the in the near future. So we'll we'll have a good time with this one. The um, uh, couple of guys here that are joining us, uh, Davin and Eric, uh, that are going to be our co-hosts today. They're going to um, uh, it, it's it's how I met uh, Eric, who has been a four-time um, co-host here on our on our series. Uh, I'd been chatting with Davin. Davin and I have known each other for years. And I've uh, been talking back and forth. I help him, you know, with some of his data stuff. Sometimes we just chat about motorsports and racing and internet and whatever. And then, um, <clears throat> and, and Davin ended up hooking up with Eric on, uh, on a couple of things and chatting about uh, data and, uh, and ended up setting up a process where they did some, uh, some virtual data coaching and it was very successful. And, uh, and because of that, I was looking for somebody to come in and chat with us about carding data. And, uh, uh, and Davin introduced me to Eric and Eric has, uh, has been here several times now. So, uh, that, that's how we kind of got the, all this kind of rolling. And, um, uh, uh, but the, the virtual data coaching, something that, uh, to me is, a uh, uh, is the next step. We've been talking about data. All of you that are watching this either have an interest in or have, you know, data loggers. And, and I look at the, that virtual data coaching piece of it is, is that next step. We've, we've been teaching you which icon to push and, and how to read your basic data and, and how to, uh, you know, maybe import, export data, whatever it happens to be, we, downloading, you know, uh, split reports and, and, and channel reports and all the different things, all good. But they're, uh, it's the tool, right? That the, the data is the tool, and then you need to actually interpret it. And uh, and and while we have done a lot of that, there is a there's often a need uh, in all forms of motorsports, in all forms of uh, human endeavor. You need coaching, right? And uh, and uh, sometimes we can have the person right with us. Sometimes we can't, especially in these times. And uh, so. Uh, what we're going to talk about today is, is is how to get somebody else to look at your data, talk with you about it. You know what is the power of that? What is the process of that? And uh, and 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 how 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 do you do it? Right. So we're gonna, that's what we're going to chat about today. So uh, I'd like to go a little bit of a deeper introduction with these folks before we jump into the actual part that we're going to talk about. Um, the first the first co-host we have here is Eric. Eric's this is his fourth time, as I mentioned. Eric runs. Uh, a Colorado, what what uh, is called Colorado's premier cart store on my bullet point here, the uh, uh, point carting. Uh, and Eric's been running that for quite some time, been a racer, uh, driver, instructor, you know, author, race administrator. He has a guide out that is that is pretty cool and it, uh, it's called Carting 101. It's on his website, a link to that on his website. Maybe Brick, our link master, can, uh, can, go, can go out there and find that and link that in a minute. It's pretty uh, pretty cool document. He's named Dealer. And, uh, and, and, and the way I met uh, one of our deep, first deeper conversations with Eric was he, he does some, uh, has done, obviously it's kind of a bad time this time in 2020 to do a lot of these on-site things, but uh, he's done some uh, seminars in Colorado for carters to help them. Uh, no doubt he's been doing those one-on-one -on -one now. So uh, Eric, add a little bit to that. What, what, what gets you here? Uh, you know, what, what has changed a little bit since you've chatted with us in the, in the past? I know, uh, I know you've been pretty busy. Uh, yeah, I, I guess just, you know, point carding continues to grow. And so uh, that keeps me pretty busy. But, um, you know, I guess at, at first, you know, you kind of laid out the lineage of, of how I came to be here and, and the opportunity to, to be part of these webinars and, and share my interest in, in data. And it's something that, um, you know, some of the, the videos that uh, you and uh, Davin put together actually was how I first started uh, when I was a student at University of Colorado, I would basically sit there in a lab and my internship and also uh, follow along in the steps and say, okay, now I know how to use Race Studio. And I started implementing it at Trackmore and, um, you know, become a big believer in it. And um, I try to get a lot of my customers and clients to look beyond just saying, okay, well, this, you know, data logger can show me lap times, but okay, you know, now what can we do and how can we apply that? And the opportunities come along to work with Davin as well as some other people uh, outside of my region, you know, through virtual coaching to 
make an impact by looking at video, the race studio data, the micron data, and, and, and be able to help people go faster. And so that's, that's why I'm here today. Perfect. And, and we appreciate it. I, you, you know, there's a lot of work that goes into from your guys' end getting pre prepared for these things. And, uh, and, I, uh, and I appreciate all the extra work on top of uh, an already busy schedule for both of you. The, um, uh, a, a little bit, I, I mentioned I've, I've, I've I met Davin quite some time ago. Um, a big old long list of uh, bullet points there. But what, uh, the, uh, what I like about Davin is he, it says competition Carter, but uh, Davin, I think, and you can you know, correct me if I'm wrong when I get done, but you started in rental carts and then uh, as far as from the carting side, at least, mm -hmm. and then, and then transitioned into being a, a competition Carter. You've been doing it for a while and, uh, and, and it's been fun to watch the, the, um, the curve, right? As you just keep getting better and better and better, this is not an easy thing to do. Uh, the Northwest here, like you know, and most of the most of the world, frankly, it, karting is it was really quite competitive, and it's uh, it's hard to jump in these things and go as fast as uh, as everybody else. So, um, Davin's right here near me, uh, north of me, maybe 40, 50 miles. Um, been around uh, performance driving, motorsports, and an enthusiast of it, right? It's it's a, it's a big part of what he does in, in his life. And sim racing lately, I've known we've uh, we've chatted a lot uh, with uh, with with background using uh, you know your your sim racing stuff and bringing the data into AIM so you can continue to learn about it, about those other things. Uh, but the but the biggest most important one is he was a co-host at a series of AIM YouTube videos with uh, with me, uh, Davin. Davin really did all the hard work behind that. Uh, I, I prepared and, and, and talked about the topics and he, and he cut them up. And I think there's 24 or 25 of those. And, and it's on a playlist on our, on our uh, YouTube site there at AIM Sports. And those are uh, out there available to you. Uh, Eric talked about that's how he got kind of into this was by watching those. So those are pretty cool. Um, Davin, give us a little bit more background on, uh, on you and what, uh, what, what brings you to this point in chatting with us about this kind of stuff. I just wish people would introduce me like that all the time because then I could just be like da, 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 every time I showed up. But I mean, I mean, you pretty much nailed it, right? I mean, I, I met you when I first started with rental carts. I was doing autocross and rental carts at the same time. And then I found this avenue where I could do more competitive racing where, um, you know, the more I got involved, the more I realized that I didn't know a lot and I needed more help. And so at first it was, you know, go to the cart tracks, get your cart, get there. And then it was, oh, I have this data logger that's gathering all this information that I'm not using. So I would go to your clinics that were nearby to kind of learn some of the basics on stuff. And then you and I got connected in the AIM series when I started asking questions of, yes, I understand how all the interfaces work, but what are the scenarios and how I use them? And that's really what spawned that series of videos was, you know, I would get questions from a lot of people of like, okay, I can click the buttons and read everything, but how do I compare my lap times to my friend? Or how do I know if my braking is good or bad? And so we started to kind of go through those sorts of things. Um, and then Eric and I, you know, formed a relationship through a series of karting forums that I created um, called the Kart Pulse Forums, which was, you know, I'm a big fan of using technology and connecting people wherever I can. So with me and another partner of mine, we created this forum, a uh, set of online forums for karting because there wasn't an active one that was really being supported at the time. So we decided we would make one. And Eric came and said, hey, I saw the videos you did with Roger. And we started talking more. And, it, you know, I really became a uh, big advocate for virtual co uh, coaching because, working with Eric, he was able to kind of look at my own data impartially, because I think that's one of the biggest challenges that, you know, I have as a racer is that, you know, in my mind, I'm the best one. And so it's really hard <laughs> to look at my own data with, you know, impartiality and be able to see areas of improvement or areas that I'm doing well and not let it go straight to my head. Um, so, you know, working with Eric, he kind of helped eliminate a lot of that. <laughs> yeah. So that I could start making better improvements in really important areas rather than just hiding away from it because I didn't really feel like dealing with it. Yeah. Um, we're going to talk about the, um, um, it, just the process of doing that. There, there is a, uh, um, you can have coaches can take a different approaches. So we're going to talk about that. How, how, how do you become a good coach? How do you become a good recipient of this, this virtual coaching, right? Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about that. And, uh, and both of you are very good at what you do. What I'm going to do is I'm going to stop sharing. So then we, we pop up, we, we, we may jump into some data. Uh, we, we may not. Uh, this is more of a discussion where we're, we're introducing the topic of, of, um, of uh, virtual coaching and and how you might do that with your AIM data and and the folks that are uh, that uh, are, are watching maybe give them some ideas of how to do this. Uh, so we're not going to get too technical in 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 actually doing it today, but uh, we, we might. We'll have to see. So let me stop the share. Let's see if we can jump uh, 
all of us up to be a little bit uh, a little bit bigger. There we go. And um, perfect. The uh, uh, let's introduce the subject a little bit deeper, and then we'll uh, and then we'll dive in and 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 start to kind of chat about it a little bit. Coaching, coaching in in, in motorsports, just like like anything else. Uh, you know, NFL football teams have 20 or 30 coaches that are there and, and basketball and baseball and weightlifting and, and, and every, all forms of, of when humans are doing things and they want to do it better, they, they, they search out ways of, of getting better with it. Everybody that's watching this has, is doing that at some level by, by purchasing their, their data loggers and then downloading the software and, try, and starting to look at it. They're trying to make themselves better, obviously, and, and try to figure out to where they can go faster. And in our world, it's all, it's all about the speed and the consistency of doing that and, and, and placing up higher on the finishing order. The, uh, and then, as Davin mentioned, you know, at some point, you get to a point where what you feel in the car, what you see in the cart, and then what uh, what you're seeing in the data ends up aligning, right? And you think that's the best you can do. And sometimes you need that second set of eyes and uh, on it. And whether it's from somebody standing right side the track and then looking with you over your shoulder, you know, sometimes that's not uh, uh, doable. So then we we get into this this virtual side of coaching, but the coaching is the same nonetheless. And uh, so there are different tools we might use when we do it virtually. So the um, it, there's there's all sorts of ways to do it. It's uh, you know, Eric provides this service. There are a lot of other people that do something similar to this. I don't have all the names, certainly, but uh, just a couple of um, uh, webinars ago, we had Jeff Brown on, on, and we were chatting about inside racing technology, and, and Jeff mentioned that he was at Road America and you know, coaching or, or engineering a team, and, and, uh, and his Ferrari Challenge team was out running that car where he normally was there. He had, you know, it was kind of a double booking thing because of the way motorsports happened during this, this, uh, this crazy year of 2020 where, where, th where races were moving. And uh, so he ended up, they ended up setting up a thing for him where he could see the data see the video and actually had a headset that was connected through technology and was able to talk to the driver even while out on the track. It, uh, so there was a bunch of coaching and data and technology happening there with Jeff. Uh, Peter Kraus does a lot of, uh, he's, for years he's been doing either coaching on, 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 on you know, actual track track time or on the sim racing side. Uh, Davin will mention here in a minute that uh, that he's actually done this on the on the sim racing side as well with some others. There's Racers 360 with uh, Dion von Moltke that, uh, that does a, has a service where you give them a video and they within an hour or two are, are back talking to you. So that's real time, almost you know, almost real time. Certainly at the track, you you get some feedback from from driver coaches. So there's a lot of this virtual coaching that's going on. That's just a few examples of of what it is that we can search out and find some more of that. But um, um, uh, at the end of this, I would like to, to maybe encourage you know some folks to to to, to think about this, and maybe think about getting a, a virtual coach. Um, and 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 if you're good with the data, maybe maybe helping out friends and you know doing a little bit of this, it, it ends up being a a valuable tool for both. It, it's as somebody that. Uh, um, does it from the other side, you know, giving the advice and help, helping people look at their data. I always learn something from that end as well. You know, that it's, it's a, it's really a two-way street when the, when all this is said and done. So um, the um, we've, we've talked about who you are and what you do. What I'm going to do now is kind of turn it over and um, uh, to you guys to talk about what's the experience like. And I, I think what we'll do is We'll start with Davin and, and and talk about you. You already kind of touched upon it, but maybe you could just uh, uh, touch upon it a little bit more. You had a need, and mm -hmm. there then you started to 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 you'd done your own data work. You certainly were chatting with me. You were chatting with other people. Um, uh, th there's only so much I can do for you. I'm not a cart racer. I don't. Uh, I'm not a coach, right? I, I can help you try to learn the data, but at some point you needed or felt like you needed. To chat with somebody that knew the data and the and carding and motorsports and uh, and help you out. How did uh, how did you make that call? Why did you make that call? And how did uh, uh, how did the process start with Eric? And then we'll go to Eric and we'll we'll chat about how he how he's seen it happening from his end and what how he handles it. Yeah. Okay. You know, I think where I'll start is that I found when I first got into motorsports that this was largely a people game as much as it was a technology and technique game. And so, you know, one of the things that attracted me to racing in the first place was meeting a bunch of different people and learning from them and, you know, sharing what I knew and kind of working together. And so as I started to kind of go down the route of competition karting, um, I had worked with some coaches kind of in person, but I found that 
sometimes I needed additional feedback and dis- in additional ways, right? Um, and I think sometimes when you are working with a coach in person, sometimes they use their eyes a little bit too much. And so they're not really giving me impartial information. Um, a lot of the feedback I would get was like, well, so-and-so just went that deep. You should go that deep. And so-and-so did this, you should do that. And I would start asking questions like why or where or how, and they couldn't answer those questions for me. They would just say, well, this person's good and effectively you suck. So just suck less. (laughs) And that wasn't helping me. So I started to first dig into my own data to say, okay, look, I, you know, I'm not in the business of, you know, fighting my coaches all the time. So I would, I would start to look into my own data and try to see what I could find out. But my own biases were a limiting factor. You know, I would, whenever I drive the car, whenever I drive the cart, I have this assumption that I'm doing the best I can. And so whenever I would look at my data and I always go, that clearly must be the best I can do. My fastest lap must be as fast as the car will go. I can't make it go any faster there because either I'm going as fast as I can or I'm scared, one of the two. And I couldn't impartially look at my own information very clearly with a trusted resource that I knew that was gonna give me back effective information that was gonna make me more competitive. And so, you know, kind of through multiple discussions and talking about this in the forums that I mentioned earlier, uh, Eric and I got together where I had said, you know, I wish I knew somebody who could help me look at my data impartially and really help me meet my goals um, in a way that I could easily receive, like, you know, be receptive to. <laughs> um, and so, him and, and, I- and in your, in, in your, uh, your work life, it, you, um, it, this is not a foreign subject, right? To, no. to, to you. So it, in your business, you, you have mentors that you've worked with and help, help you set goals and understand how to get to them. So mm-hmm. it's, it, it's, you're bringing the same thought process that you use in your entire life into your motorsports. Right. Sports. Exactly. Yeah. I'm a consultant by trade, right? So, yeah. you know, my job typically is to help other people reach their goals. And so the first thing that I always end up doing is I ask them what those goals are and why do they feel like that we need to prioritize those and we come up with strategies to meet them. Um, and then, you know, kind of take it step by step. And so, you know, working with Eric, I was fortunate that he had a, a similar mentality to kind of how I do my job. So we clicked right off the bat. Right. Um, and so, you know, I think the thing that really was beneficial working with Eric was that be, especially because he had um, carding experience, we could speak the same language. So that really helped. And then so he started to learn when it was important to sometimes look at my own data versus when it was important to compare other people's data to my own data. Um, Cause sometimes it was a matter of like, Davin, you're doing this thing really well. You just need to do this thing really well, more consistently. So we're just gonna focus on you. And other times it was, Davin, there's another person that's doing this better than you. And let's see if we can figure out the variables to get you closer. Right, and, you know, they're the same weight class, the gearing is close, right? Those sort of variables are all kind of the same. Let's see if we can get you there. Um, and sometimes it was a matter of um, technique change. And sometimes it was a matter of setup change, which helped me because in the past, all I was being told was that the driver was always the single point of failure and you always were the one screwing it up. And so it would just ding my confidence every time to be told basically you suck repeatedly. <laughs> yeah, is that, and what, uh, what Davin's ex- is, is- is talking about is coaching in general, right? It's not lost on me, everybody, and we will get there in a moment on the virtual side. But I think we do need to set this table of, of, of the coaching piece first. And then uh, here in just a moment, we'll talk uh, more detail about the, the virtual side. Eric, from your point of view, you're, you're sitting there uh, being happy doing your, your cart shop stuff and you've been work- coaching people, no doubt, in, uh, in carting at your track and your customers and your clients. Um, when did you start to, Davin mentions that you started to chat a little bit. Uh, how did you transition into, into coaching uh, Davin? And, and then eventually we'll talk about the virtual side. Well, I think with Davin specifically, it just started by uh, meeting and, and need. And I think at the, at the time we were, we were talking about it and I realized, you know, you have, we have all these tools and there's no reason that um, many of you, whether, whether you're in a cart or a sports car or, you know, maybe you go to track days by yourself. A lot of coaching or debriefs are either informal or you're talking to someone else in the pits, or maybe you talk to someone else on the phone or you watch a YouTube video of some fast guy, you know, local guy driving. Um, there's all these different ways to consume information, but really, you know, and I think all of us see this now in, in our day-to-day jobs, whether it's in motorsports or other things. I mean, there's so many tools now that yeah. we can meet virtually like this obviously like, here we are uh, exactly so <laughs> it, it just occurred to me you know when I started driving my coaches it was much more what Davin is talking about um, 
they would stand by the fence. They would watch. Maybe we'd look at a little bit of video, but there weren't some of these tools developed. And and now not only do we have these tools to do this in person, say in a trailer at the car track or uh, debriefing in between sessions, you know, at, at your local road course, or even you know looking at it when you should be working uh, at your normal job. Um, but now we can interact uh, with people across the country. Um, people like myself who I've never been to one of the car tracks that yeah. Davin has been. Um, but fundamentally, the, the issues that he's combating are similar to my clients here. Um, and so those are the kinds of things that are relatively universal. So, so a couple questions that people have asked actually dovetail into this really well. Uh, Bruce asked, you know, do you use the same approach when, say, you're, you're virtual coaching in a cart versus, for example, autocross? Well, yeah, I mean, fundamentally, you know, it, the tool might be slightly different and the course might be slightly different, but fundamentally what we're trying to do is pair someone like myself who has maybe a little bit more experience in that particular discipline. So Davin, you know, I, I know you've done some autocross. Um, I'm not an autocross racer myself, but fundamentally how to find your way quickly through a course or around a course is going to be similar. The, now, physics, the physics haven't changed much, right? The right. physics <laughs> haven't changed. Um, the virtual coach gives you a platform within which where you can, it can be a little more flexible. You can choose who you want to interact with, who really works well and speaks your language. Uh, Dad and I seem to click really well on that, or maybe other people it didn't quite work as well. But it, it just opens up the expanse of the types of people that you can work with and, and the approach that you can work with. Um, and that's actually where I wanted to go next. It, it, if you if you sit back and, and now you're doing this, you're, you are not only coaching, but you're the, the virtual coaching, right? You're doing some of both, no doubt. You're you you see people out at the track or people stop by your shop and you look at their data with them. Right. Um, how do you not not just how do you coach, but how, how do you how do you how are you to be a good coach? Those of a, you know, we got a lot of people that are listening and watch this on YouTube later. The um, there there are steps. Right? You can't just go to to Davin. You can't just go to Roger and say, you know, uh, let's break more gas. Right. That, you know, there, there's there's more to this. Right. It, obviously, there's a there's a level of, yeah, go faster. Well, no, it's deeper than that. Right. <laughs> how, how do you attack uh, coaching and making it where it's 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 as palatable as possible that it, you both have a, not only a good time, but a rewarding, you know, uh, process where both of you get something out of this. H how do you attack coaching? You know, um, I guess it's been an evolving process. It's, it's like trying to teach just about anything. Um, you know, there's, <laughs> there are some expressions about uh, teaching that I think are a little unfortunate, like, you know, those that can't teach or, or things like that. But what I've, what I've found is, at least for me, it, through the coaching, I learned a lot about, um, you know, just personally how to how to explain the same concept in very different ways. And I think probably one of the best examples of this actually wasn't um, in karting. It was uh, I, I was hired to do data analysis and driver coaching for a group that race uh, Porsche GT3s at at high speed um, road courses. And I guess what I would say is a lot of it depends on the client. A lot of it depends on the way in which the client works. So Davin, for example, is a, is a fairly analytical guy. He's a consultant by trade. He, he mentioned some things that, that align with his value system. He wants to under, you know, for him, the way in which he works with other people is he understands their needs, sets a goal, and then helps them achieve that. Well, so for him, a, a way that seems to work is we need to understand what his goals are first and foremost, and then find ways to achieve that. And some people are visual, some people are more analytical. Um, at this particular event, you know, um, I, I would say to answer that question, the best coaches are able to adapt to the needs of the client in terms of how they interact with them. Fundamentally, the way that we're connecting by, as a virtual coach doesn't change, but the way I may explain what I'm seeing may differ. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, Matt, I'll, I'll read your question in full in a minute, but uh, you mentioned you have a child who's nine. For example, if I'm working with someone that's younger, I may not show them all the squiggly lines. I may instead say, let's put a GoPro on our vehicle and look at it like that. Whether they're younger or maybe just newer in experience, that can be a tool that I may use. Or perhaps the educational background or the, the personality of who I'm working with lends itself to being, maybe I'll explain things more in an engineering sense or 
a lot of other people, um, maybe they were coached in some other sport and they, they want to hear, I'm like, maybe Davin, the approach that doesn't necessarily click with you, for example, a lot of them just want to hear, do this, do this, do this, now go do it. And they don't want a lot of higher level explanation. So yeah, that made me mad. So <laughs> the, the, uh, the key in being a good coach is being able to adapt to the different learning styles of, of the student, because fundamentally your job is to communicate to them how they can improve. And if you can't speak that same language, then that's where things fall apart. Learning styles. It's it, it, you, you use the term several times there and I, and, it, and I keyed onto it as soon as you started talking, we have James Colburn that came in, gosh, uh, five or six weeks, you know, three or four weeks ago or three or four uh, webinars ago and talked about learning styles for different people. Right. And, and again, we can make this distinction of coaching versus virtual coaching, but it, it, in this piece, it's the same, right? It's the same thing. You have, you, it is your job to figure out a way to get the knowledge that you see in the data, the video, and in, 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 in your mind, the, your experiences to, to the client, to Davin in this case. And some people are better receiving that it was squiggly lines, some of them in table, some verbally, some in, in video, whatever it happens to be. And it's, so it's your job as a coach in order to be successful successful at what you're doing is to understand the way that they need to learn that. James talked about that and uh, in a little bit of a, uh, you'll see the slide here in a moment for our next webinar. Our next webinar on Tuesday is going to be Learning Styles Part 2. We're going to talk about this in, in more depth with, with James Colburn, and we're going to bring Matt Romanowski in at the same time, where, and we're going to kind of put together three or four of these things, you know, two or three of these things, learning styles. We're going to talk about tire pressures and, uh, and we're going to bring uh, you know, some of these topics we've been talking about uh, together, but virtual coaching will almost be a part two of that and learning styles as, as part of that as well. So I appreciate that the, with, the, with, with Eric talking about how to be a, a good coach and not just the virtual side, but uh, overall. Davin, how do you be a good student? Right. That's the next question yeah, is, that, is, how do you do that? And not virtually or, or whatever, but just how do you how do you be a good student and be ready to accept the data? Well, I think the first thing I'd start with is not have any particular expectation on yourself or on your coach right away, because it's about building a relationship and kind of understanding each other and not just trying to demand like uh, excellence on the first session, on the first lesson, right? Um, for Eric, for example, I know that he knows karting and data really well, but he didn't know my local tracks. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't come in saying like, I want you to fix my entry speed in turn four, or I want you to help me be a better breaker here or something else specific like that, because we didn't know each other very well yet. And to me, there are, there's a, you know, kind of to align with learning styles. There's a lot of terminology that is unique to every specific person that you need to kind of understand that person first before you're able to give them guidance. Um, so it's so like, I used to do some driver coaching back in the day and I would try to avoid things like um, break harder or just break more or go deeper, like very vague terms because my version of harder and your version of harder may be dramatically different. And so for me, harder could be just 10% and for you, harder could be locking it up. And so we had to learn about each other to figure out how we were, you know, communicating first before we really started getting into the heavy hitting stuff. Um, because we also had to kind of learn what our trigger points were. I, I'm sure I frustrated Eric a bunch of times where he would give me some guidance at first and I just go, mm, I don't know. <laughs> or I don't want to do that. <laughs> right. But, and but then, in order to set that table, did you, as you were getting ready to go, now we're going to kind of transition maybe a little bit more into the virtual side. Mm -hmm. Now, now you've, you've decided to, to use this technology and to work with this. And I'm talking to you, Devin, from your end. Uh, what did you provide Eric or what did Eric ask for? Uh, anyway, did you give them, did you give him a, a link to the Google Earth view of the track? Did you, did you give him a video file, link some video files? Did you give him some of your data? What's a good way for you to start as the student and, and, and getting to getting your coach up to speed and what you want to do? I feel bad for his Dropbox because I kind of gave him <laughs> everything. <laughs> like, I was just like, here's a bunch of data I have, right? Well, so we, we kind of broke it into pieces, right? So I, I gave him my some recent session data just so he had a sense of um, some things to start looking through, like before he looked through video, before he looked through Google Earth. Because, you know, from my perspective, I wanted him to have a little bit of a history of kind of my driving style and kind of how I drove. Um, so he could identify trends before we even started talking. Um, they may not be things that I would change automatically, but at least he kind of had a sense of how I drove based on some recent data of things he had seen. 
Um, I sent him some videos of some of the tracks that I drove, just so he had some realistic perspective of what some of those traces meant versus, you know, what he saw on data. Um, I tried to give him pretty clean, like open laps a lot of times, but sometimes I gave him some data of like me in battles or in traffic because sometimes that was useful. Um, he would notice things that would come up only when I was racing another car that maybe wouldn't come up when I was by myself. Um, and then the Google data was also kind of useful for him because then he could have that additional tool to just show overlays in cases where that was relevant. Just the um, layout of the track. Just uh, the layout of the track, exactly. Right? Beyond a because, GPS trace, yeah. Right, exactly, exactly. Because, you know, we, we both need to be able to kind of see the same things as we were talking about, you know, what we were trying to improve on. And so by kind of giving him all that information, it kind of gave him a clearer place to start. Um, okay, and, and Eric, when you, when you get ready to get started and he's feeding you a little bit of information, was this something that you that uh, that you asked for or was it uh, again a very per client or, or uh, what what's important to you as far as getting yourself up to speed of not just the the the, the client but the the track and the type of cart or the type of car or whatever it happens to be um, I would say that 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 was a process that it took me a little bit to learn oh. um, Andy actually uh, in, the, in the chat asked asked a question about this specifically you know does it does it is it helpful to have, say, someone else's data to compare to versus just one driver's alone, or um, things like knowing the track specifically, or what have you? The answer is those things always help color your context um, and can help you answer um, and 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 help the client. But they're not always necessary. A lot of times, especially when someone comes to you looking for uh, data coaching or virtual coaching, a lot of the, the habits that people have, whether autocross uh, or any form of you know, four-wheel motorsports, at least, which is what I have most of my experience in, chances are a lot of the habits are similar, um, is what I've, what I've noticed. There's, there's four or five common habits that a lot of developing drivers tend to have, and even advanced drivers. We were talking you know, before the show started about, you know, you may watch a really fast qualifying lap, and if you've had even you know, a modicum of of motorsports experience, you can say, oh, well, they may miss that apex or wow, they really overdid that braking zone. So um, it's about finding, finding data that's relevant for that student. So, so Davin's you know, providing me with some initial data was great. Once we got to a certain point where we had kind of cleaned up some basic issues, then having someone else to compare to once we kind of hit a certain plateau, that can be really helpful, especially if I don't have the context of going to a certain track so where as Davin says, you know, if I say, well, you need to break harder into this corner, he may already be as deep as really that vehicle can, can go. And I have no way of knowing that without comparing to, to other people. But um, at least initially, um, the types of things that, that he provided me with, you know, were data files um, and then video. And having, having those two tools in particular are, are very helpful. So an onboard video and then also um, some data files from from a track, as well as these other tools that you can do, are are really really helpful. And Davin, oh, one other thing that I was going to add to that, Eric, it's another thing that you did that I thought was extremely valuable. Is that you kind of mood checked me as we were going through our sessions, kind of asking me how I felt in certain areas of the track or over a session I'd done or a race I'd done previous, which was really really helpful. Um, because you would always ask me like, where do you feel the least comfortable? why do you feel that way? And I might be like, I feel terrible in turn four. Well, why? Well, I feel like every time I get on the brakes, the car is just going to go straight and I'm not going to make the turn. Well, why? Right. And we would start to kind of dig into those things and we would focus on that area, um, which would sometimes help me from a confidence perspective of just, you know, sometimes it was just Devin, the car is going to always feel weird here. Your traces are the same. Your minimum speeds are the same here. You're not losing a lot lap over lap and if i look at other data you're giving me it's pretty consistent it just you need to be comfortable feeling uncomfortable here right where in other cases it would be the inverse of like i'd ask what he'd ask me why i was feeling comfortable and it was because i wasn't going fast enough because you would see in certain areas where i'm clearly under driving and it's like well Devin, the reason why you're feeling comfortable is because you're going slowly and i'd go oh okay <laughs> well that help us find a place to prioritize rather than me just sending you a bunch of data and be like tell me what's wrong <laughs> right, because it was more complex than that, and it required you to be able to kind of understand me and kind of how I approach things, just as much as just like looking at data and seeing obvious flaws. There was some basic stuff I think you saw automatically, but once we kind of even those things out, then it was more how do we get to the next step? 
Yeah, it's 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 funny that when you're when you're looking at things, if you see a, a you know somebody turn in turn in, relax their hands and turn again, you know that's a that's a technique that you can see in the data real quickly and fix, right? Uh, but then if you if you're just driving at at, at that ninety five percent comfort level, then maybe you need some other data or you need to you know, the the mental aspect needs to come in. You need to chat a little bit more, figure out what 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 Eric did there. Eric, was that a learned skill that you learned with Davin, or is that something you you had already kind of had in your playbook. And I'm asking these things to help the people that are watching to be a better student and a better virtual coach, right? Uh, is How did you come up with those? Is it, or is it an uh, always uh, evolving process? I think it's an evolving process. The more students you work with, the more kind of brick walls you're going to hit, right? Where you thought, oh, this, this tool works every single time. This person's going to get it. And then you run into someone that has a different learning style or it's just clear that they really, really want to improve, but what you're telling them just isn't clicking. And you know, someone like Davin, and, and part of what, what makes a really good student and coach relationship is um, you know, being able to listen to criticism from the student or feedback from the student of, I know you're trying really hard to help me here, but it's not making sense to me. Those have been some of the best students for me. Um, and that's, that's a great, point that I want to bring up that I think is a great advantage of virtual coaching versus a traditional way is you open up your avenues of who you can work with and the way that they're going to interact with you to so many more people than just your your local region um, and I think that that's one thing that, that a lot of people may want to consider when when doing this is you're going to find someone that that is really going to speak your language and really is going to be able to help you and it, it may be from an avenue that you didn't initially expect. Mm -hmm. um, I will I will plus one that because honestly, that was one of the challenges that I was running into when going through the coaches that I had local access to. It's just, we just didn't really click, right? They were good, but mm -hmm. we just didn't speak the same language or they had expectations of me that were different than my expectations of them. And if, you know, from a consulting background, if you can't get on the same page on expectations then the relationship is doomed to failure. So, you know, working with Eric, it was really easy after having worked with a few other coaches before for me to come to him and say, look, basically, Eric, this is how I want to be treated. And here's the data I have. And these are my goals. Can you help me reach these things? And, you know, we were 95% of the way there. And then in some cases, Eric would come back to me and say, Devin, in order to get what you really want, you're going to have to be willing to take this sort of criticism. And I'd be like, okay, you've got a good point there. And, the, and it was almost easier because he was looking at my data like he was looking at my data without looking at me. Yeah. So it was easier for me to consume that criticism because it's like the, the trace doesn't lie. The squiggly line doesn't lie. Like your breaking is just weak here. It just is what it is, right? It's not that I don't like you. <laughs> it's just, <laughs> this is just something you need to fix. And it was almost easier for me to consume that feedback virtually than somebody that I knew where there was a little bit more of that personal interaction that might've been harder for me to consume. Yeah, interesting so, that uh, the, the the difference between coaching and virtual coaching, and you know, to continue to fall, find these little trends, is is there sometimes there's value to the virtual coaching because you're not with the guy all day long, and you're not chatting with them at the concession stand, and as you walk by and you know changing a gear or something, right? You uh, you can uh, you sit down, you've dedicated this hour where you're going to chat about this, and it's just very focused. Mm -hmm. And it, and the personalities aside, it's you know, hey, the data is the data, and the video is the video, and and we're going to chat about it. It also worked with my schedule really well, right? Uh, like with in-person yeah. coaching, right? It, they had to be there when I was there. And if they couldn't yeah. be there or I couldn't be there, then it just didn't happen. Yeah. Where with virtual coaching, I could go practice whenever I wanted to. And I would just send my package over to Eric and say, this is the session I just did. Please take a look at your convenience. And he okay. would summarize it. And we either had meetings where we would meet. So I knew when I was going to meet him or he would send it back to me in sort of a recording of some sort. And that was really helpful for me because sometimes I could just step away from the frustration of being at the racetrack where I just can't seem to make this lap time. Well, and, where there's a lot of stress already, right? Right, exactly. Yeah. And maybe I, I just won't be receptive to hearing that important feedback right yeah. then because, you know, damn it, I'm trying. Yeah. Where when I'm at home a couple of days later, I can sit back with a cup of coffee and look at it and be like, okay, I'm, I'm listening to what you're having to say. I've come up with a couple of strategies. Let's talk about those strategies. And the next time I go to the track, I will try to apply those things. Um, that really helped me because, I mean, I'm not going to lie. I can be a bit of a diva sometimes. So in-person coaching sometimes created a lot of friction because I'd have a coach that was screaming at me to just damn it, do this thing. And I just wanted to scream back. I'm trying. And we never really got anywhere. <laughs> Perfect. I think we've set the table here a, a little bit. And I'd like to go over and 
and and and and take some of the questions and answers that are in our our our, our question and answer kind of a free form thing. Either one of you can take these as we go, and, and then we're going to come back uh, and and let's talk about the technicalities of the virtual coaching. How how do we share data? What files? Let let's let's uh, let, let's kind of go save that towards the end, and then uh, and we'll go from there. Let's let's start right here at the top of my list at least. Andy asked the question: Is teaching a new racer way easier than helping a thirty year racer? I think that's a great question for you, Eric, to start off with. Is it is it better to start with somebody that doesn't know a whole lot about it or somebody that's very experienced and set in their ways? I've been eyeing that question in the chat <laughs> and really thinking about it. Um, the answer is it depends, um, which I know is a, is a frustrating Always an answer. answer sometimes. Yep. Um, it comes back to what we've touched on, which is the, the student-coach relationship. Um, a 30-year racer probably has more experience, and chances are over 30 years at least, they've stumbled on what works for them. Breaking those habits can be harder. It can also be easier. It the answer is, is teaching anyone that has 30 years of experience necessarily easier than someone new? The, the answer really depends on the goals and the ambition of the student. I would say that a 30 year racer probably, probably on average has more ability to be flexible, mm -hmm. but they also have perhaps more resistance to doing so because they found what works for them. Um, you know, so I, I would say that, that both are easy to coach if they are willing to learn. And that's one thing that um, as a coach, it took me a while to reflect on, but um, Davin touched on this, you know, being a bit of a diva, all of us that drive, whether we are, um, you know, a track day, kind of person and we're, we're almost taking this as a project to just improve ourselves or we're co racing competitively. Um, all of us that drive have a bit of an ego associated with it, whether we want to admit it or not. And so that has been the biggest thing that I've tried to reflect on is when someone comes to me to ask me for help, that alone is a really big step. And it's very easy to overlook that because I do this day in and day out. But it's important to acknowledge that as a coach that just someone taking that step to say, hey, I'm not as good at this as I would like to be for something that is so often ego driven as driving and being good at it or bad at it. That says a lot about your student. Um, and, and, and that often colors the conversations that I have. And it, it makes it a little bit easier for me to work with that 30 year racer that might be a little bit more stuck in their way or the new. Yeah, it's, it's interesting that you've got you, you and I don't know all the, uh, the quotes, but you have that when you first get into something, you, you know, you don't know anything, right. Mm -hmm. And you're, and you're willing to ask and you're willing to accept and you're, and you, boy, you're, you're, you're begging for people to, you're searching so hard to find information about it. And then you've got the, you've got that, you know, year two or three or whatever, where you, where you, hey, you know, I've really got the hang of this. I, you know, I'm, uh, I, I'm really good at this. And then you go over that hump, and then you find out later on that you, boy, I don't, uh, I don't, uh, I don't know nearly as much as I thought I knew, right? Just a year or so ago. And then, so you've got that in that in the in the two ex extremes that we just chatted about. You know, that 30 year guy and that uh, that one one year uh, user or brand new user. Um, for Davin, uh, the. Um, did you have expectations of Eric that you communicated with him? I think we did talk a little bit about that since the question has came up, but uh, maybe we can go in a little bit deeper. Did you did you go jump in and say, you know, boy, I, I'm struggling on brakes, or boy, turn four is got me concerned? How, how did you, uh, when you first started that conversation, did you give him the expectations right away, or did you let that flow as part of the natural coaching? I think the only expectation that I had of Eric was that he worked with me to solve the problem together rather than just beat me up over something I was bad okay, at. Okay, so more of a technique. Thing. Right. We, we know you want to get faster, obviously, mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. so there was, you were setting the expectations of, of you know, hey, hey, this is how, this is the box we're going to stay in. Right, this of. is the box we're going to stay in. And, you know, I'm, I'm here to, to learn, but also to solve this problem. And you're here to help me solve the problem and we'll communicate together. And we're just going to, you know, collaborate about it. But, you know, depending on what we specifically focused on, you know, I, I needed him to tell me because there are just things I don't know, I don't know. And so I might think I'm a fantastic breaker and he'll look at me and be like, nah. but I also might think I'm terrible at something and he'll be like, oh, actually, you're really good at that. You should not change that at all. Right. And so, you know, I, I didn't want to put any 
any bias on Eric. Um, just like I wouldn't want him to put any bias on me because otherwise it doesn't really help. Like if he came to me and it was just like, I was expecting you to be better at this. I mean, like, click, and I go find another coach, <laughs> right? So, you know. Yeah, it's different. Appro it's, uh, Bruce made a note in the, the chat that I actually wrote down because I thought it was, uh, it's, it's a cool little catchphrase, right? Approaches for coaches, uh, mm -hmm. both from your side, what you're looking for, and, and from Eric's looking out, the, uh, how, do, how do you attack this, this, uh, this relationship, right? You, what you are wanting, is probably uh, absolutely you know uh, the inverse of what somebody else might want and it's up right. to eric to understand that and then say okay well this is how he wants to be taught or this is the way he demands you know just from his personality or whatever th this is what you need to do eric from your side when uh, when you start to hear when you're chatting with somebody and you're 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 starting that relationship. It probably starts on email when you, when you first do it, and then you probably have some sort of either a phone call or a you know a, a Zoom meeting like this or something. Uh, is that one of the things you're doing? Is you're reaching out and trying to understand? Okay, how how's this guy learn? How how's this gal understand? What how do we get that information to her? Uh, it, it's something that if I if I really have no reference point, a lot of times when people reach out, they will say they will either overtly or inadvertently kind of give me an indication of, of where they're struggling based on the severity of maybe how they approach it or really what their goal is they will usually give you some indication of what they're trying to accomplish and you can kind of go from there learning how to work together is is a whole other thing that sometimes it's important to ask uh and other times it's important to um you know just let them kind of guide you. And I, I've learned over time that it's important for me to identify that quickly um, and pay attention to that very quickly because otherwise that initial forming of relationship and them trusting you doesn't, doesn't necessarily happen. Um, to that point, I would say, um, you know, we, we've talked a lot about the different platforms or, or the different ways that you can use a virtual coaching. Um, you can use it uh, it's not as impactful, for example, if, if you know, it's a, it's a father, son or father, daughter relationship where you both are right there. Um, but let's say you were doing this with one of your friends or someone that you knew, uh, that had similar uh, data to you. Um, one thing I've noticed a general trend is a parental figure or maybe a more dominant friend in a friend to friend relationship. Typically the person receiving coaching input from them doesn't work as well as someone that kind of what Davin was touching on is, is someone that really has no skin in the game, hasn't necessarily been to that track or doesn't know you super well and doesn't have that implicit bias. For whatever reason, the recipient, the student, um, tends to respond better to the same yeah. criticism or input or, or what have you from the independent party than someone they know, which is, oh, which is an interesting point. Oh, there's one other thing I want to add. Sorry. Um, mm -hmm. um, the other thing that I also really leverage Eric for is a foil for other coaches that are coaching I get in person at the same time. Because often, like, I'll have someone who's with me at the track that's giving me some sort of guidance. Break deeper here, do this, do that. And we'll look at my data because we're both there together, do this, do that. And I will bundle that session up and I will send it to Eric and say, Eric, what do you see? because I would like to have a third party look at this information without maybe that closeness to see if we're saying the same thing. And sometimes that would help me validate what other people were telling me. Um, Cause sometimes just getting one source of truth wasn't always the most helpful, right? And I would, I would do the inverse too, is Eric would look at some session data of mine and I would write down some notes and I would go to the, my team and say, hey, like, you know, I think I should work on this, this and this, can you watch those things for me? Yeah. And as I'm driving, they would be like, you know, actually I think you're fine there, but this and this do make sense. And sometimes I would tell them I was using my virtual coach and sometimes I wouldn't, right? right? Because like, you know, sometimes I just don't need to know. Yep. So that was a really helpful tool for me to sometimes validate certain things because sometimes you just get bad advice, right? Regardless of where it came from because someone's missing information or just uses the wrong words. And so when it, both people were saying the same thing and you know, Eric's in Colorado and this guy's in Washington with me and they're both saying that my breaking sex into turn four, maybe they're both onto something. <laughs> Right. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's funny, Davin's background as a, as a data guy, right, and, and a consultant. It's, it's funny how you're, it, it just fits your natural way of wanting to get more information to make better decisions. It, and, and other people may not work that way. And, and it's up to Eric to kind of, to kind of do that. In, 
in my background, as I and I've spoke with many of the folks that are watching here today, you know, quite a number of the folks that are watching here maybe have sent me some data to to ask to to, to look into technically how to do something, right? Or mm -hmm. they've phoned, and uh, early on in my career, it, uh, I have knowledge. I, I make up my mind, and this is a bad thing, uh, you, you would make up your mind within like 10 or 15 seconds of what the person is asking and what you need to tell them. And, mm -hmm. uh, and my evolution as somebody that is a, as a support person in, in data has been just to slow down, shut up and listen, and uh, to, to basically what Eric has already said a little bit, and then understand what do they know, what are they looking for, and formulate a plan to give them the best, that information in the best way that fits what they're asking for, right, mm -hmm. and then their personality. And that has taken a while for me to get to that point, and, and Eric has gone through that exact same transition, it sounds like, of, of uh, or evolution uh, of how you, how you teach, you know, and, and, and it's, it's kind of funny, I've had to just... Uh, I, I get emails from some people sometimes and I sit down and I'll just take that email as we're getting ready to, to have a Zoom session where I, I'm going to look at their data with them or their video, whatever. And uh, and I break their email down word for word exactly what they have asked, right? I I, I respect that they have asked me for something that uh, that they want to know and, and I walk through it, right? And obviously sometimes the conversation goes somewhere else, which it should, but, uh, but, but we always start with that expectation to begin with. Go ahead and uh, Davin and then we're going to answer those last three questions and get into the technical side. Sure, no doubt. I just wanted to summarize something you said because I think also as a student, it's equally as important to do that to just kind of slow down, yeah. shut up, and listen. Yeah. Because you know, a lot of folks assume that like, oh, I'm working with a virtual coach, they should solve my problem the first day, <laughs> right? And like, that's just not how learning works. Um, and and a lot of times, and and Eric does this with me often, is that there might be a you know, how do you take down an elephant, right? Like one chunk at a time. So there may be this big overarching thing that I need to work on that just is too big of a leap for me to do in one session by myself immediately. But we can systematically work our way closer to solving that problem of like, you know, Davin, I need you to break more consistently at the same point all the time before we start moving you closer because you moving closer inconsistently is gonna be a problem. And for me, getting that strategy helped me formulate and sometimes even shortcut the process because I'd be like, oh, I know what Aaron's going to ask me to do next. He's going to ask me to do this and ask me to do this. And then I could then be prepared for the next time we got together where I could say, you know, this was the plan we stuck to. I made a small modification to the said plan and I'm starting to do this now. What do you see? Right. Oh, um, having that, having that slow down and just take it one step at a time really helped rather than like, oh, I'm just going to send him my files and he's just going to give me a two word answer and I'm going to yeah. win the race. Yeah. <laughs> your, your expectations might be just a little high at that point. Yeah, just a little, just a smidgen. Uh, I have a question for you, for you, Eric. Uh, uh, Matt asks, I, I have a kid, nine years, you've probably read it, but I'll read it for the folks that are uh, YouTube watching. Uh, I have a kid, nine years old, uh, in carting, and she's been doing it for a few years, but still a little off the pace. Would your, uh, would Eric's carting 101 be a good reference for her? Obviously, the parent would be working with them, but uh, us, uh, or is there another reference tool you can recommend to, to kind of start the process? Uh, maybe virtual coaching may, may be one of the things that's coming up down the road for that person. Well, if, you, if you've been doing it for a few years, then yeah, virtual coaching could be a tool. Uh, I would say carting 101, um, well, I'm proud of the publication, probably isn't um, the tool that you would want to use. Um, some of my sense. favorite it really that that book was written as a 40,000 foot overview of the sport for people that are very new to it. Um, I've wanted to do some follow-ups and sequels. I just, I wish I had infinite time. I think it's <laughs> all of us do. Um, some that I would recommend to you, Matt, um, Ross Bentley uh, has a great series of publications. He continues to put out work. He is one of the most renowned driver coaches uh, in the country, if not the world. Uh, and it's, it's just fantastic, both on a mentality as well as just a driving technique side. Speed Secrets. Um, speed, I think it's, I think it's speed even speedsecrets.com, I believe, is, is where you get that. Maybe uh, yes. Brick, Brick can look that up and give us a yep. shot. And um, there's a, a guy, uh, his name is Terrence Dove. He put mm -hmm. together a book um, that is more on the driving technique of karting specifically. The other thing I would suggest based on your daughter's age is I would also look else outside of motorsports directly. Um, and I, I forget his name, but there was a series of articles written by the father of, and I guess this one is in motorsports, but of uh, Roger and Nikki Hayden talking about what it was like being a 
motorcycle parent yeah. and what it was like balancing the parent coach relationship that I really, really loved. And I unfortunately can't remember his name, but I would also recommend checking that out and maybe also just looking at coaching approaches from other sports other than um, for, for youth for youth uh, drivers, especially because it, obviously the, the, there is tons of parallels. Uh, Joe in the chat mentions that Bobby Rahal, Rahal recognized that his son Graham Rahal needed to race for someone else. At, at at some point, you've done as much as you probably can do, even if you're you know, Bobby Rahal, right? You, uh, Indy winning, you know, driver. At, at some point, and he also goes on to say that Wayne Taylor was the same way with his his two boys are currently yeah. uh, you know top top professional drivers as well. So kind of interesting, um, Davin. I think we touched about a little bit, and we're going to tie into the technical side, which, which files, but what initial data did you give Eric to start your process? Was it, sure. was it, it was data and video, correct? Right. It was data and video. Yep. I, what I tried to do is I tried to give him recent data of um, something I had driven as recently as possible on tracks that I was going to come up with soon on my calendar so that I could yeah. use practical approaches of something I was like on a track I was going to go to. So it didn't make sense to show him data on a track I won't go on for another year because I'm not going to use any of that information, but like I, I gave him my race schedule and I said, these are the tracks I'm going to be working on the most often. Um, and we typically picked a track that I felt like I was struggling on the most. Okay. So at the time it was um, PSGK, which was mountain highway. And so I gave him that track and I said, I'm, I'm there frequently. I feel like I struggle at that track often. Um, I could use your input there. And so we focused a lot of our attention on that track so that, you know, that way we were always kind of speaking from the same page and we didn't kind of stumble over the like, well, I don't know the track. I don't know what that turn name's called. Like we just kind of got through that really yeah. quickly. Um, and then occasionally I would, when I was going to other tracks or like bigger events, um, like especially in our regional kind of level of racing, if there was a big race that I was kind of nervous about, I might give him some data of um, a, a practice day I was doing. Or in some cases, because one of the advantages of virtual coaching is that I could package up some of my data and send it to him if I prepped him ahead of time and said, hey, this weekend I'm going to be gone on this track. Um, I only really want to share you Friday practice data because once we get into the races, I'm going to be too busy to look. So I'm just going to give you data from Friday with some video. We had a joint Dropbox that I just dropped everything in and I dropped everything on the Dropbox. He uploaded in the information and he would maybe like call me and tell me, you know, how are things? He'd look at the lap times and, you know, pull together some information. And so sometimes it was just a matter of saying like, Davin, you're a 10th off the lead. Don't change a thing. Just race better and keep your head up. You're doing all right. So like, technically, what one of the things uh, I want to touch on this one, obviously, before we get done here today, was you guys used a, a joint, a shared Dropbox, mm -hmm. um, you know, some sort of cloud, you know, place to save things is um, is what you used. Did you always use Dropbox, or was there any other suggestions you might have? I think we use Google Drive for a little bit too, right. because of the storage same requirements of the though. same technology. It's the same cloud drop, you know, kind of folder structure. Um, and, and Eric, you also used, um, YouTube videos and private channels, which oh, I thought was right. really helpful because there were times where like the file was either too big, or I just wanted to be able to look at them like on my phone and I have to re-download a file every time. So one of the nice things is that you can load videos to YouTube and then save them to private playlists so that only you can see them. And so I had a private playlist of just Eric's feedback of Davin and no one can see that but me. Perfect. And I would be driving to the track or, you know, my wife would be driving and I'd be, you know, riding along and I would just be listening to the video of Eric's points as we were going, um, either looking in my notebook to see if I had written that down or like, oh, I didn't, I wasn't paying attention the last time. I'm going to put that down. Uh, interesting that you ended up using a, a process where you sometimes you did it live, sometimes you did it where Eric would record that and then send it to you. That, that That's an interesting dynamic that I hadn't uh, thought of too much. Yeah, so, the recording was helpful because sometimes our schedules didn't line up. Yeah, exactly. And so, you know, virtual coaching, what do you know, right? But also I needed to be able to sometimes replay what he said because it may not have made sense to me the first time. And so, you know, he'll explain it to me three or four times and then we have to go do something else. And so if I had a recording, I could just listen to it until I was like, what? Did you mean by that? Okay, I got Re it. rewind back and listen to it again. Mm -hmm. the, uh, as far as the technical side, there is uh, there is um, when you share AIM data, there is um, our older hardware. We had a couple of files that you have to you have to share. Uh, on the newer stuff, you can share just a single file. And the older files, which also work on the new stuff as well, it's, so it's kind of a, a little bit confusing at times. But there is a DRK a DRK file with the extension of DRK. And, and you must also share the matching GPK. Those two files need to be bundled up and sent to whoever's going to look at the data. Uh, that will work on all data, whether it's a Micron 4 
uh, Micron 5, Micron 5S, you know, all of our brand, you know, all of our uh, Evo 4s, uh, MXL2s, all of that, the DRK, GPK combination, two files with the same, you know, same prefix, same names, uh, will get the coach what they need. There is also one other file that is on the newer equipment. Say you had an MXL, this file won't be there, the, the older generation stuff, but the new generation has an XRK file. That is the file that comes out of your Micron 5, your, your, your MXL2, your MXG, your MXP. That uh, XRK file, it can be pretty large, and it, but it, it is the file as it comes off of the logger. And if that is too big for email, let's say if you're going to try to do it with email or drop, you know, Dropbox, it's not as, uh, not as quite as important. When you open that up in your log, on your race studio and look at it, then you can take the DRK and the GPKs and send those. Those often bundled together and zipped together is smaller than the XRK. So it, 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 if, if file sizes are a problem, sometimes it's better just to send the DRK and the GPK. But if it's uh, right out of your logger, you can send the, the, the XRK and, and, and put that in Dropbox so the driver coach or the, uh, the other person can, can look at that. And of course, the Smarty Cam videos are, are .mov, our, our, our movie files, .movs. And those can, uh, those can be pretty large, obviously. So your Dropbox, you can't probably use the, the free version if you're going to do more than uh, you know, a few sessions at that point. But, you, uh, but uh, uh, your, your OneDrive or your Google Docs or you know, some of the other ones uh, work well. I know we're close on time, but there's a quick hack for some of that too. Um, oh. Sometimes I would upload my videos to YouTube because That's YouTube exactly. has lots of storage. And so exactly. I would just use YouTube storage and then send Eric right. the videos that the, way. The, the private link, especially. Yep, the private link, especially. Yep. Yeah. And I was like, here, here's my raw data from the session I did. It doesn't matter how big it is because Google's going to pay for it. So here you go. <laughs> exactly. Uh, in the links in the chat, and they'll be in the links of the description box, There's uh, we, we've got quite a few tips on um, uh, videos. Uh, either from myself or James Colburn's done a, a bunch of them where we talk about exporting data and importing data. So if some of you are thinking about doing this and don't quite know how to move the data around, there'll be some links in the description box or they're in the chat right now. Um, a couple, one other thing I really want to talk about before this is over is, and, and maybe it's it's more of a question for, for Eric, is, is is the structure of, of, of the, the fee structure. Do you typically do, uh, for, for folks maybe thinking about this, is, is there some sort of an hourly thing? And not, not the numbers themselves, but do you do an hourly thing or do you just do a session based? You, you say, okay, I'm gonna, we're, we're gonna chat about this one and you know, your Friday session and, 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 uh, and it's gonna be two hours and, and the, here's the fee. Or do you do some sort of an hourly based structure? That's a good question. Um... You know, I will preface it by saying I, I don't know how other people yeah. Um, yeah. structure this, and I can't really comment. But typically, I, I do a I approach these things with a flat rate because okay. I've noticed that you know some clients it may take me thirty minutes to give them an impactful and actionable thing, and others we may get much more granular. So um, yeah, typically it's a flat rate kind of fixed schedule, and then in terms of how often that really depends on interacting with the client on what they think is appropriate mm -hmm. and the flat rate really is the fair way to do that because there is never your your, your 37 minutes you spent with the driver is not your the extent of your work right you you have you've done pre-work leading up to it and mm -hmm. then you you've probably got some sort of a report that you do afterwards and you send them a follow-up email and you know and some some reporting structure that uh, that helps uh, solidify the process so it, it, the hourly thing is a, is a little bit tough the session is probably the better way to do it i well, would think Devin. That also helps too from the you know customer side, so you can see the value of what you're getting in your first mm -hmm. session or so. You know, uh, my biggest concern with some of the coaches I had worked with in the past is they would charge me some absorbent rate that it felt like, and I wasn't exactly sure what I was yeah. getting. And so they'd be like, "Oh, I'll charge you X amount and just tell you to go faster at the end." And I'm like, "Okay, thanks for nothing." Where with working with Eric, I, you know, I got a flat rate. I had an experience, and I said, "This is the experience I want, and I will continue to pay for that because I'm getting value out of it." And it made it much easier each subsequent step rather than being like, oh, I hope I get something this time. And I felt a lot less like gambling, so. The last question that, uh, that I think we'll cover today is, is for you, Davin. Um, the, uh, you, you've got a coach here with Eric that talks with you about your karting data. What about sim racing? Did, did, you're, you're big into that, I know, and, and you really enjoy it, and you use that as a teaching tool in all of your motorsports. Have you, uh, have you reached out and had uh, coaches virtually in sim racing? Yes, I have. And ironically, it's a lot easier in sim racing just because the medium is all online anyway. So yeah. we're already using the internet. But I, I do use virtual coaching um, 
for sim racing because you know I'm not the best at sim racer either. <laughs> and it's 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 really helpful to have somebody there with you, either you know watching a stream or in a lobby with you or looking over some of your data. I send folks aim data from I said of course all the time. They just you know because they're looking at the same traces, so it works the same for them. It doesn't really matter what I'm driving, right? Um, it helps both of us being able to kind of analyze what's going on. Um, sure. And then also, too, with those virtual coaches uh, in sim racing, they can also give me, like, platform tips that I just am not considering, like, you know, not to go too technical, but, like, if a tire model changes for a particular sim you're using, that will change how the car behaves. And so if I'm comparing a lap time that I've si seen on a video from a year ago, that's not the same, you know, yeah. track as it is on the most latest build. So I'm yeah. frustrated because I'm four seconds off, and in reality, we're comparing apples to watermelon. So right. having a virtual coach in sim racing has been really helpful because they can really give me an honest impression of how I'm doing. Perfect, perfect. I'm going to share back into the presentation as we kind of close this up. Uh, the uh, let's see, it's this one here. Yeah, there, there you go. Um, this will be available. I appreciate everything, but everybody talked about and uh, the. the the again, this is kind of our first step into the virtual coaching piece, right? We're we're going to talk a little bit more about this, but we wanted to kind of set the set the table here of of what are the requirements, what you know, the, the processes. How do you even overthink that? You're know, not over. How do you think over the process and make sure that you're going to get the best out of it? I think that was what this discussion was as much about today, and uh, and I enjoyed it quite a bit. The uh, this video will be up on YouTube within an hour or so uh, on our YouTube site that, you know, this will be a, uh, this is number, you know, 137, I think that we've got up there plus, uh, you know, and, and we have more all the time. Most of the recent ones are all of these, these webinars that we've done, you know, this not being number 72 and uh, we'll continue on. So visit our YouTube site. There's lots of functionality kind of things, all the stuff that Davin and I did together, those 24 videos, uh, plus of course, all the webinars that we've done, uh, you know, here, here so far as well. The um, um, continue to give us a call. Ask us. We, we've uh, we've got uh, uh, our aim. Uh, technicians are out on the road. Uh, there's a bunch of them in Texas this weekend and some other spots uh, that uh, that you may see if you're out there on the road. Keep that in mind. If, uh, if you don't see us at the track, give us a holler, uh, email. Uh, you know, we got the 800 number that's uh, it's always out there for you to give us a call on our tech support line. So give us a give us a give us a shout. I mentioned it a little bit earlier, but our next webinar is uh, is, is a bit of uh, tying some of this all together. We're going to have James Colborn jo join us again. We're going to have a great time with that. There was such great feedback from his uh, his last one that he did about learning styles and just talking about and and opening up our minds as users of you know how do I learn? What is the best way to learn? How can I do this better? Where I can figure out some things to learn. Uh, James is going to talk about adapting your learning style. You don't know what you don't know. I, I, I was uh, really, really thought about using that phrase a couple times that you guys basically, uh, Davin, you even said it, I think, at one point. The uh, you don't know what you don't know. All of that's going to be wrapped around James, who is a great coach and teacher of data, got his own series of, uh, of, of webinars out there, uh, the YouTube videos. Uh, he reached out to Matt to learn a little bit about some tire pressure stuff based on what Matt had uh, showed us in a recent webinar. And they used uh, technology to do it, uh, remote coaching, and they, they learned some different learning styles from that. Um, we basically want to go through that process. James is going to go through that and chat about us what what he learned, how he learned it, and the technology they used to do it. Uh, I think it'll be a, a great tie-in with what you know some of the stuff that we started to learn today, and then continue on with even some of the stuff that Matt was Matt was showing. So that'll be really good. Visit with us. Uh, come join us on Tuesday, December fifteenth, next Tuesday, uh, same same uh, ten a.m. Pacific, one p.m. Eastern. It'll be a, a, that'll be a, another great one. So. Um, uh, kind of closing this out, some, there's some contact information for you if you're uh, interested in uh, uh, getting a hold of Eric and, and, and chatting and maybe a little bit about virtual coaching or, you know, Davin's out there on all his uh, uh, social media stuff. He's a pretty active guy and, uh, and chatting around and talking with people. And of course, he's got uh, his cart post forums that he talked about as well. My email address is there. I appreciate everything you guys, uh, all the work you put into this. It was a great conversation. I think we, uh, you know, uh, you know, um, gave some pretty good information to a lot of folks that might want to learn a little bit about this. A uh, couple, any closing words, uh, Davin, about uh, where we're going? We'll get to you in a second, Eric. No, I mean I appreciate the time inviting us here, Roger. I think this was really great, and I hope that more people are excited to do some virtual coaching, whether it's through Eric or through someone else or just between friends. I think 
you know, this is the perfect time in our lives to be using this technology. So yeah, maybe thrust upon us, but it certainly is. Uh, I think the uh, us as a uh, an industry was ready for it anyway. But uh, so it, so it's pretty uh, pretty good timing, like you say. Eric, you got anything to kind of close us out with? All right, I'll just echo um, Davin. You know, it's, it's always a privilege to be able to hop on these, and I hope that this inspires some people to start having those conversations with whether it's a coach or a peer or um, you know someone else just kind of in your sphere in motorsports to start talking to them you know using these virtual tools that we have now start sharing and talking about your data and uh, share that passion for motorsport that we all have and um, if you have you know if anyone has any questions please reach out to me happy to chat about it Perfect. Thanks, guys. Again, I appreciate it. It's uh, it's fun to always chat with both of you guys. I always enjoy that. Um, everybody else, uh, uh, this will be up on YouTube in a little bit. We'll put all the links we talked about will be in the description box below. And uh, for the live webinars, I, I look forward to seeing uh, all of you this coming Tuesday. Talk to you guys then. Have a great weekend.